Uh, Matt, um, <laughs> you uh, you got to know Joe Eichler uh, pretty well because you worked for him and with yes, him for yes, yes. actually ten years at least. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about Joe as as a person? I mean, I look at him and admire him for I think a style and and, and qualities, but what? What do you? What can you say about Joe as a person? A very complicated person. Not a simple man. Uh, I don't know the people who worked for him. I thought saw him as something of a driver. He saw himself much more as a, a liberal. Uh, his associations with labor issues, let us say, were more philosophical than his association with working people. Uh, he had a good sense of humor, a lot of sense of personal style, loved color, especially in that context, like clothes. Uh, was perhaps more involved in and interested in what we might do in a model because he himself was interested in the components of this. Uh, what do you mean components? Oh. Textiles, furniture, oh, of the, accessories. The, of the interior decoration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interior design, please. Um, <laughs> well, decorating's fine. I just didn't know. You know, decorating for me has a sense of real impermanence. It's something you do to Christmas trees, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it, it should go as it should come. Uh, the design, even though it certainly was a transitory thing to do a model home, implicitly related to things of more lasting value. I'm very concerned with that. More about Joe Eichler. He was very courageous, it seems to me. To, I think he to was. To go out and do these contemporary homes which were non-conventional. Yeah, I, I think he was courageous, but I think also he took small and careful steps into the uh, almost monumental achievement, maybe not almost, monumental mm -hmm. achievement of his life's, what became his life's work, a retired man, changing completely. He was absolutely the dairy products business that had retired, and as I understand it, it was that money that he was using to reinvest in small uh, subdivisions that were conventional at first. Yes. Yeah, it's like in Sunnyvale, I think he did one. You know, you're asking for me to remember things that I may remember inaccurately. So I don't want to just, I don't want to tell you that any of this is fact, mm -hmm. but is my perception of what was going on. Well, he was very courageous, also in a in a liberal way, I suppose is what we would call it, in terms of the CCNRs of the day. Oh yeah, blocking race blocking uh, the black people from moving into a neighborhood in this area. It wasn't like in the South, it was in this area, uh, he all was, around the Bay Area. Right, it certainly was. He was shocked at one point when <clears throat> he got some negative mail from people who told him to, to uh, lay off his political attempts to, his attempts to influence them politically. It may have been during the Hubert Humphrey campaign or something that he, uh, he, you know, circularized and tried to con to get people to to accept his his uh, his views. He saw what he was doing in housing to be something that only people of a very liberal leaning would be interested in, and was shocked to discover that that once they became good buys. They were appealing to a yes. lot of people with a very different economic orientation in our culture. Yes, uh, for the sake of the viewer, we are living in an Eichler here. Yeah. Uh, it was built of, uh, for you by, uh, Joe built a number of Eichlers in this yes, uh, Stanford Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Eichler, Holmes, Eichler Holmes did. You used the word Joe soon after his stay in the Army, Ned Eichler. His younger son became a very significant component in the way the company worked. Mm -hmm. And Ned and Joe did not agree on everything. Well, uh, all fathers and sons. Um, your challenge as a uh, interior design, how did, you, how did you start doing that? Well, remember, I'm a product of Cranbrook. 
and I did no interior design at Cran Cranbrook. I don't know if they could, but the components of interior design, the fabrics, mm -hmm. the furniture, the lighting, all of these things were being explored by different people at Cranbrook. And we worked not necessarily collaboratively, but as a community. This was the school you went to before you yes. came to Stanford? Yes. Because you were still quite young when you started yeah, working with youngest, Joe. Yeah, I was very young. I was, I was too young. But I did it. Mm -hmm. You can see, if I came to Stanford and I was 21, and I was at Cranbrook for three years before that. Well, uh, did, so the, one of the problems was a, a little bit of ha having people understand how their life might be in this non-traditional environment. Well, uh, in that sense, the, the uh, models became uh, instructive, almost educational, and <clears throat> having, as I did, access to university faculty, especially in the art department, I was able to get a little series of presentations. They were bigger than seminars. Uh, they were sort of small speeches and an evening now and then of some person who would have strong convictions regarding uh, design, contemporary design, where we were going and so forth. Mm -hmm. And these were mainly aimed at the people who, I guess the nucleus was the sales force, so that they would be more sophisticated. I mean, Joe had a brother named Al and he said, we don't care if a tap dancer buys one of our houses. So it wasn't a universal thing that everybody that had access to this phenomenon understood it and moved it in the direction in which it seemed to be born to be moved it. <laughs> I would think that Joe started off in the most perfect area for his business. Uh, for one thing, of course, the times were right. People were coming back, uh, uh, they needed housing, so uh, 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 developed housing and subdivisions were, were really required. But also, there's a lot of uh, technical engineers, uh, art people uh, in the area. And I was an engineer. My first house was an Eichler. I bought it in 1964 in Sunnyvale. Uh, I see that an awful lot of people who live in Eichlers are in the technology field, uh, design, engineering, yeah, things like the that. Ones they you appreciate notice, it. They're the ones you notice and identify with. I would say that there's a full spread of, uh, of uh, professional and cultural orientations of people in Eichler homes. And that if there's something that's truer of them than of other houses, since the houses are, the Eichlers, are unconventional in many respects, people who are comfortable with that, or better still, uh, inspired by it, mm -hmm. are likely to gravitate toward Eichler homes. So you expect the communities to be what I would loosely call more, more progressive. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the genesis for, or the inspiration for the designs that Robert Anchin and other architects, uh, Claude Oakley, etc., cetera, uh, did was traced back to Frank Lloyd Wright in general in terms of people talking about it. Um, you, gave, you had a story that I heard from uh, a talk that you gave in, uh, on the Eichler uh, uh, thing where where they were celebrating the historic uh, naming of uh, some of the neighborhoods in uh, Palo Alto. And in this story you talked about uh, Joe taking Frank Lloyd Wright around the corner to see a subdivision of his that he wanted to show Frank, and you had some yeah. well, I guess comments they, that Joe was... They, they may have been to, to lunch, there was another story about who paid for that lunch, but <clears throat> um, then it was time for Joe to show Frank Lloyd Wright what he was doing. And when they reached, became into view, able to see the subdivision. I don't know what, which way the car came, but Frank Lloyd Wright is said to have put his hands to his head and say, my God, what have I done? <laughs> it's interesting that he didn't say, my God, does anybody think I had anything to do with this? Yes, yes. Yeah, he was responsible for so much in his mind. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright and Richard Neutra, of course, uh, I'm the director of the Neutra house that we've saved in Los Altos, and uh, that's one of the uses uh, we're interviewing you for, of course. But Frank Lloyd Wright and Richard Neutra had some common thinking about 
uh, somewhat tyrannical control of their uh, of the houses that they designed and how the people should live in them. And uh, you had some comments also about uh, these styles and how you tried to show that such styles were not required or not. Well, I, I'm not sure exactly how to to respond to that. I think inadvertently, <clears throat> an Eckler home, because of its simplicity and because of the structural uniformity of them, was an enticing opportunity to go beyond one way or another for the for the user to go mm -hmm. beyond the the inherited structure one way or another to assert himself, herself, the family, whatever the case might be. In other words, in other words, they could almost be perceived as unfinished. And I could mm -hmm. imagine that Wright would have felt that way about them. And that it came became our responsibility to finish them. I don't mean mine and Lee is doing mm -hmm. the model, though in a way our models were to stimulate people to take a hand in them and also not to do certain things. If you respected the fundamental structure, if empty, it was mm -hmm. still a work of integrity and clarity. It didn't make sense to try to treat the interior of the house as if it were utterly other and you wished you didn't have it and did have the conventional alternative. So the little winding path up to the front door that somebody liked because they'd had it in New England doesn't really make make much sense. On the other hand, we did want them to understand, for people to understand, that other works and other times and other materials and other cultures that are done with this genuineness, with this integrity work and this can be textiles, it can be furniture. Uh, certainly some of the early American things, wooden, oaken things, well, that, yeah, that, were that, very happy. In, uh, that's in a question context. I have, is, uh, is do you feel as a, as a design uh, person that uh, these modern houses, the contemporary home designs, are comfortable uh, with uh, modern art, certainly, in them, but also comfortable with almost any kind of art? Absolutely, and my peeve with propagandists for Eichler Homes in organized ways, much of this coming out of the North Bay, is that the idea of something being right for an Eichler home tends to be equated with it being something that resembles an Eichler home. Ah, yes, okay. Okay, and that so some of the articles I see that push people to buy prints or paintings to hang on the wall that were geometric and angular because the houses were geometric mm -hmm. and angular, you know? And so they would advise us, these written works, you know, to, uh, to emulate the look rather than to understand the independence and the responsibility to be free and inventive and personal in what they would do. So it seemed counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And though, you know, I mean, the most, I can remember Charles Eames once saying that our, uh, our cheapest and most valuable material is space. And that certainly is true for the house in a way. You, you know, it's the spaces. When you buy a house, you don't look at the walls, you look at the spaces. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and uh, uh, so somebody will come along and say, in, it it's, gets printed, you know, negative space is very important when you're deciding how to hang up hang pictures on the wall. And uh, I understand the term, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's such a thing as negative space. I think it's all positive space. And you use it with respect for itself, not simply as an interim neutrality between things that interest you. So uh, I, kept, I kept encountering comments from what I would call the updated Eichel world that were uh, in fundamental contradiction to the, to the inventiveness, to the philosophical content, to the chutzpah, Yiddish word meaning nerve, uh -huh. of, uh, of an Eichel home. Well, it's fun to have surprises, I think. Uh, otherwise, it's boring. Well, the surprise, you know, like we've did, been doing design shows at Stanford, and one of them featured surprise. I'm very interested in surprise. Mm -hmm. I, I, I use uh, 
uh, some rather unexpected stories for a professor to tell students because I think in humor you discover when you get a punchline you don't expect the utter power of surprise. And I think that that should also be true in the design process. And it tends to be left out. And uh, um, predictability is something that the marketplace would seem to require of design. I mean, I've heard, I've heard of a, a person who was, was quoted as, as saying designers are not trustworthy. You ask five designers the same question, you get five different answers. Well, I say yippee, you know, to that. Well, and I'm an engineer, and the concept of engineer bandwidth is that the more surprise there is available within the yeah. content, the more bandwidth is required, yeah. and the more valuable it is. Well, something I use in teaching, and I certainly use it in my own work, is a preference for, uh, come on, Matt. I had it in my mind and I just lost it. Um, well, uh, just, just let me give me a second. You can edit this out, this this pause, but I just got to get it back. Uh, it's funny how that happens, isn't it? Come back to it, and I'll give you another topic. Um, when you were mentioning an empty house. In my mind, there's nothing more beautiful than an Eichler home that's completely empty, but all of the landscaping is done. Because in fact, when you landscape the outside, you decorate the inside. Oh, in many ways, yes. Many ways, yes. I can remember doing a ceiling for a big model for Eichler homes and painting it slightly pink because I knew that the grass outside would have an extensive lawn yeah. would reflect green when there was sun on it and neutralized and warmed the it ceiling. Up. Yes. So That's great. It, it worked. Well, I think the, the designers, Frank Lloyd Wright and certainly Richard Neutra, and they both studied Japanese architecture. I mean, yeah, yeah, so the Japanese was a, a central uh, theme in a lot of the development of the, of the contemporary yeah. architecture yes, yes, and yes. The, the gardens and how you bring the indoors and the outdoors together. And that's certainly a characteristic of our little Richard, our little Nitra house that we saved in Los Altos. And the phrase is constructive dis dis to, the, the phrase is constructive uh, disobedience. That's great. Constructive disobedience. That's great. Positive surprise. And yeah, that's, you know, I asked my students to do that from the beginning. They have assignments, so there's something to disobey. But the disobedience should get us deeper into the motive for the assignment and not take us on a vacation away from it. Well, I mean, that is the essence of creativity, that you have to have the courage to uh, trust yourself and, and do your own things, do something different. You, you're, you're not married to conventions. No, you, absolutely you can break not. Out. And, and that sure sometimes it happens in spite of not having the courage, you just can't help it because circumstances lead you to it. I mean, I'm not sure what I'd have done if there wasn't a period of my time, my life when Eichler Homes could be the vehicle for that. I refer to it in that little thing I had you read as a kind of a designer Camelot. Uh, yes, can we talk about that yeah. a little bit? Um, um, uh, I, I have it, but uh, can you kind of go over some of the points that you were making uh, in that paper? Do you, uh, do you have it with you? Yes, I do. <clears throat> because I need glasses. There may be some... Uh, I can probably manage without them. Okay. Let's see, the forego foregoing would open the door to a brief discussion of my own designer role as a propagandist. Uh, this is in the context for, for of... For Joe, oh, for yes, that This Holmes. is in the context of one of six lectures, and this one is on propaganda. That you All give? kinds of propaganda that I give to students in design. A company of merchant home builders, Eichler Homes was distinguished, distinguished from its competitors <clears throat> by retaining architects to design its houses. The presentation and promotion of its radical product were greatly handicapped by conventional advertising and model, modeling methods that simply didn't fit or work. Model homes, for example, the major pieces in the promotional puzzle had been grudgingly left to furniture retailers who had their own, often tawdry, products to push, and in doing so, pushed an Eichler interior completely out of shape. Eichler Homes bit the bullet 
and decided to purchase rather than borrow and so control its own appropriate furnishings and hired me with Litacon, my wife, to select, coordinate, install, and detail its model elements, bringing the house to life by, by working with rather than against their space and structure. Our installations were somewhere between sensible and idealistic, answering questions and dispelling doubts as to what living in such a home might really be like. We held the view that the simplicity and structural uniformity of these houses inspired experiment and variety rather than obedience and predictability. There it is. There it is. Drawing the line only at kitsch and imitation, we included objects that were both old and new, exotic and domestic, severe and cushy. The customer could not and would not be advised to start from scratch and go modern. We found the components everywhere. There was no one source that could guarantee taste. I might add to that that we only read the things for sale ads in newspapers that people, you know, moving just advertised that they had this or that for sale. For about a decade we were a part of this design Camelot or designer Camelot designing brochures, signs, and ads, as well as showrooms, promoting a product we believed in. Vivid in my memory are the special presentations advertised in the Sunday supplement. Then the cheeses and salamis hung, for, hung in the kitchens, live flowers took to the tables, live art graced the walls, and children rode carousel horses mounted in the garden. That's great. Thank you very much. So, you know, simplicity then is is a, a, a benevolent container rather than an absolute austere, austere authoritative statement against doing anything. Well, let me change the subject just a little bit now. Um, with the Richard Neutra Design Houses in Los Altos, uh, one of the clients was Jacqueline Johnson. She was a graduate student at Stanford studying English. Uh, writing a dissertation on Ben Johnson, and then she married a surrealist painter who then evolved into yeah. abstract painting, and you know of him, Gordon Oslo Ford. Mm -hmm. She was friends with uh, Robert Motherwell and uh, Roberta, Roberta Mata, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Wolfgang Palin was uh, one of their friends, and they were doing work on the surrealism, and they actually converted kind of away from that and did other things. This was in the time when they returned to the Bay Area in 1947, and they lived in the Bay Area for the rest of their lives, they were part of the art scene. Uh, did you have any uh, contact with any of these people, or, or have any... Not really, but I have some strong views about the Surrealists. Mm -hmm. One is, they'll be eternally grateful for the way in which they opened up, let's say, American public awareness of the immense power and quality of Native American art. Native American, yes. And I uh, am a collector of Native American art. And when I can't afford it, I try to make things that express the same, the same excitement that I feel in them. Uh, surrealism per se, and it is interesting that you note that they moved away from it, tends not to really deal with a very strong statement from the form but rather a very, uh, let's say, fascinating but very traditional rendering of a dream concern or a fantasy of some sort. Yes. Uh, Dolly's molded, melted clocks, of course, are, 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 are too, too easy an example of this kind of thing. Okay, but, I just stop you just for a minute and move you just forward a little bit. Uh, the sunlight is uh, is hitting your hair and causing a okay. a sparkle that we're not really able to. <laughs> okay, carry on. A anyway, uh, where were we? Surrealism. The uh, Native American uh, uh, art and uh, how they. Yeah, well, they, they 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 did uncover and were excited by this kind of material, but the uh, the the problem I felt and feel in terms of. Eichler Holmes on the one hand, but even more importantly, pe significant people like Richard Neutra, 
is that they are less concerned with with what something is than what it's of. And what it's of is usually a kind of dream fantasy that though it is fantasy, it is nonetheless utterly realistic and illustrated in classical terms. Do you enjoy some of these uh, artists' work? Very little. <laughs> Very little. Yeah. Uh, I can respect it as a skill trip mm -hmm. and uh, as a tremendous ego trip. Well, of course, on the part of some of them, not others. You mentioned Mata, I think. Yes. He's one He was an architect yeah, uh, at I, one time, and he yeah. quit. He studied he, with Corrosier. Yeah, he's, he's someone who I would, I would, uh, <laughs> in my little academy in my head, I would admit, I would accept, because though his things considered to have that three-dimensional, polished surface, modeled, deep space, atmosphere, in a tradition that is really Renaissance. He uh, nonetheless did this with high, a high level of inventiveness mm -hmm. in the form itself. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't what it was of, it was what it was that mattered. Now your work, uh, we, because of history, have this desire to kind of connect uh, Jacqueline Johnson's uh, further life in modern art with the uh, Nartra house that we have. But when I look at your work, um, it is uh, kind of startling in that it looks like your artwork has clean lines and a brevity of statement, but power, a lot of power, and it looks like you could have been an architect. And, you know, the mixing of art and design, because well, design architect, is a strong element of everything you do. Architects played an important part in my design education. They all, about everybody who was a teacher of design and when I was at Cranbrook was an architect. Oh. Yeah. So I, I couldn't help but, but rub off, mm -hmm. uh, and structure is important to me. And uh, how else should I put it? I think I arrived at a very curious mixture of line and, and sprayed speckled surface. And the speckled surface, if you want to think of it that way, is what a cross section of a bunch of lines would look like. Mm -hmm. And by having this control of two elastic conditions in the painting, the sprayed surfaces and the constant play of parallel lines, and could make these interact, I could take highly disciplined structural devices and wind up with poetry. Because when they come together, then they deal with tonality. I can deal with mystery, I can deal with surprise, I can deal with all of these fascinations that are not the typical fare of someone who trades on objectivity and severity.